Okay, I'm pushing record now. You are listening to the worst marathon ever. Hey everybody, welcome to another uh, episode. You of... don't know. You don't know nothing. I don't. The second worst marathon ever, everyone. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rush Outfield, and we are doing Pixar's rules of storytelling. And did we ever find out if these are posted, like, in the corporate headquarters at Pixar? Or if this is a, just a memo that was sent out to people? Or this is something that was created by a third party based on what Pixar has done in their movies? You're going to spring that on me now? Oh, no, no, you can say no, we you don't know. You should have said that, like, you know, right before we started recording. And then we could have found that stuff out. I'm just going to say, edit this next five minutes out while I search, and then I'll answer your question, okay? I sure love to. You know, it's funny you should ask that, Rish Outfield, because we brought this up a bunch of times while we were at the cabin and unable to get an internet signal. We didn't know where the hell these came from. I just copied them down real fast and pasted them into a notes program so that I could look at them while we were there. And had no idea. And so uh, it turns out that it was Pixar storyboard artist Emma Coates who compiled these nuggets of narrative wisdom that she'd received over the years working for the animation studio. So it's not an official list. Pixar says this is what you must do in your story. It's just stuff that she's learned over the years and has you know, written down stuff that I suppose as she storyboarded stuff, people said, hey, you know what? Uh, Putting it on paper lets you start fixing it. If it stays in your head, a perfect idea, you'll never share it with anyone. And she went, oh, that's some sage wisdom. And she jotted it down and put the post-it on her desk or something like that. All right, so that's where the rules come from. Now we're going to go on to rule number... Number... 23. Seven. Oh, wait. There's only 22. I want you to put an effect on my voice so it sounds like um, one of those top 40 countdown things that you used to hear on the radio back in the 90s well, and the 80s and Why stuff. don't you just do Casey Kasem's voice? I or... can't do that. You could. You could. Remember, we both were Casey Kasem one yeah, time. Yeah, I was We terrible. were dueling Casey's. <laughs> 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 keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Reach for the moon, not the stars, you wuss. <laughs> okay, so I want you to do uh, that for my voice. Okay, ready? Number, number 16. <laughs> what? Oh, crap. We're on number 17. Damn it. <laughs> you can't do that anymore with my voice because I blew it. That's right. I turned it into a devil voice anyway. Okay. Number, number 17. 17. 17. No work is ever wasted. If it's not working, let go and move on. It'll come back around and be useful later. Oh, okay. See, that I think everybody can apply in non pixar ways. Although not to gardening. Okay, so no work is ever wasted. Help me out here. How, how would you apply that to your writing? Well, I mean, you, you plan a story and you spend a lot of time. And sometimes you'll go down a path in your story. And at some point you may realize that it just doesn't work. That it's not getting you where you want to or where it is getting you is not good. Something like that. Obviously, this is this would be in the pre-planning stage that you would be doing this kind of stuff but i guess i mean pixar they made changes all the way up to the very end i mean that was one of the things that you could do with a computer animated film that you couldn't do back when it was hand-drawn stuff because that would be like oh we're gonna change the scene so months of new drawings please whereas with them they're like oh okay well beep, 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 okay there it's changed I'm sure it's not that easy, but it might as well be. Well, before you've actually rendered everything, when it's all boxies and all that stuff, I, I imagine it's it's not literally that easy, but it's relatively easy. Yeah. yeah, it's not like months of redrawing every frame 
of the film, you just tell the computer, okay, no, we want it to do this instead. Um, and I'm sure they would, they probably did changes like that relatively often. I mean, we've seen uh, outtakes from movies like Wally, for example, where, you know, Wally is the guy who does all the stuff and saves everybody. And then they realize, no, it's gonna, it'll be stronger if Wally's the one that gets damaged and everybody has to come together to save Wally instead. And it is stronger. I know I talked about this in a previous episode, but for us it was months ago. It works fine that Eve gets hurt really, really bad and Wally does all that he can to save her. But it's stronger when Wally gets hurt and everybody realizes, hey, he's changed our lives. We need to help him. Yeah, that's really a lesson to learn, something that you can really teach to people, you know? Show Wally doing all these things and basically being kind of selfless. He's never motivated by any self-interest other than maybe he wants to be with Eve and do whatever he can to make her happy. I don't know if that counts as self-interest or not, but that's the closest he ever gets to it. And when you're that kind of a person, then people will help you out back. You know, it's a lesson that you can learn in life. Whereas the other way around, okay, was it just an adventure story and this guy does stuff to help? I don't know. It does seem like it's a lot stronger. And I don't know how the whole work coming back around later works out with that particular example. But I wouldn't be surprised if there is something. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems like that's one of those things. You spend time developing things. I mean, that's just one of the deals with writing. You develop things. You try and develop this character. You try and develop that. And maybe those things don't matter in the end. Maybe, you know, like we hear about J.K. Rowling, that she has binders and binders full of background information on all of these characters, and she knows, you know, what Dumbledore wore to the Yule Ball when he was a kid kind of stuff that never came up. But she made her characters really fully fleshed. So even if we never knew these things, and we never will, I think it still made her able to write the characters better than she would have been able to if she didn't go into that much depth in planning them out. See, I, I, I'm kind of hazy on how this works. Like, no work is ever wasted. I was thinking about like what you do with your characters where there's a bunch of questions that you can ask about the character and what's his greatest fear and you know does he like blondes or brunettes or what whatever it is you know all these questions that you can ask about your character that may never come up he likes his coffee like he likes his men black hey that ain't funny man i i I don't tend to do that with my characters and I think part of it is yeah that i don't i I think that well that would be wasted work I'd have to find a way to fit every single one of those details <laughs> into the story. And so, you know what I mean? Otherwise, uh -huh. nobody would ever know how he likes his coffee. And <laughs> maybe my uh, characters are less three-dimensional because of it. It, it just, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, what I was thinking about when, when she said no work is ever wasted was like the research that you do. Where you're like, okay, let's go out and let's find out all about sea life. Let's find out about jellyfish and we'll find out about rays and we find out about seahorses and we find out about squid and all this stuff we do tons of research but what about all the research that we did on the octopus what about all the research that we did on the sawfish or whatever these that we don't include in the movie well here it is 15 years later and we get that octopus in finding dory uh, and john ratzenberger voices him i i what I just, I don't Ratzenberger know. Ratzenberger already was a character. He needs to be the school of fish again. Yeah, I mean, that, that could be it. That's, I mean, one way it could come back around. It could be you, you know, develop a bunch of stuff for this character, and then you realize, no, that's not right. You throw it out, and then you're doing another character. You're like, oh, this is the guy that that's right for. I should, oh, that's perfect. I'm so glad that I developed all this crap now, because I can just drop it right on here. Okay. Just take the whole bucket of it and dump it on, you know? It, I think there's lots of different ways that the work could come back. But even, I think, if it doesn't necessarily come back in an obvious way like that, it still 
is there in your head. Say you developed your character to all this length, like I was saying, you know, you can write your character much more realistically than you could if you didn't know it. You know what I mean? You know that he really doesn't like fish. And then you can just, you know, throw in a little thing about, oh, no, let's not eat there. Thanks, but no. Or, well, you know, whatever. <laughs> just throw away things that could even be. Or, you know, one time I did the story, we, we put it on the show. What the hell was it called, though? The one about the guy that wrote Unfortunate. Stories. No, no, wrote the characters in his head were revolting. And there's the hot chick that comes to yeah. him in his dreams and he thought her up for a story. Right. Anyways, that story, which I funny, I can't even think of my own story tonight. Uh, well, let's just pretend it was called like Battle of the Ideas. Let's just pretend. That. Okay, okay. We'll say it was called that. In this story called Battle of the Ideas, you know, that was one of the first stories where I ever just went all out and really did all this character development on these characters. And because of that, I came up with a side plot of his wife uh, and him breaking up. And his wife was cheating on him. And, you know, the the relation, if it hadn't been that, it would have just been, you know, a carbon copy of my own marriage or something like that. You know, I would have just made his wife be like my wife and he would have been like me. And instead, it was something different, something more nuanced, something that where it changed the story things happened specifically because of of that and i would have never had that it would have been i think a lesser story because of it if i hadn't gone through and planned that stuff all out i don't know it just seems like doing the work is worthwhile even though i'm super lazy and having to do that work is the main reason I haven't gotten anywhere on my novel yet. I keep looking at all the questions that I'm supposed to answer and go, you know what? I think I'm just going to watch this video on YouTube instead. Well, what would the Pixar storyboard artist say then? Would she say all the stuff that you're doing right now is not wasted? Or would she say, oh, hell no, you're the exception. <laughs> Stop watching the YouTube videos. Yeah, she would. She would say, you suck, you lazy piece of crap. That's why I'm working at Pixar and you're doing whatever it is you do. You suck. And you're fat. Okay. I I think that's probably... That seems probably, a little bit personal. To be, you well, know. we were Skyping on video Skype. Ah, uh, so time, she could tell so, you Yeah, she that. could see that I was fat. It wasn't just a shot in the dark. Although she probably could have guessed it anyways. I mean, judging from the context clues... But my guess is, you see, I, I haven't edited any of these episodes, but my guess is we've talked a lot about Dean Wesley Smith on here, right? Probably. Um, we have a tendency to. But one of his big things that he pushes is, you know, just fix it in the next one. Write another story. Do another one. You know, you finish that book, start on your next book. And I think he would agree with this point because one of his things is somebody says that something is bad in a story don't go back and fix it just make sure that you don't make that mistake in your next piece just write the next one and so even if you write a bad story it's okay because you learned something from it and i don't i don't know maybe i'm paraphrasing and again maybe i give dean wesley smith too much credit but we've all written bad stories and if we can look at what made them bad and you know either rewrite them so that they're not or apply that to the to the next thing that we write, then it wasn't wasted time with that bad story, it's, it's, right? No work is wasted. Right, yeah, that's definitely true. If you learn something from it, then even though it feels wasted, because, yeah, you, I mean, you, you made something that can't even, isn't even worthy of publishing or something, uh, at least you learn, hopefully, what it is that the problem was, and you can fix that in the next story, make sure it doesn't happen again. That's one thing that he does always say that he does. When he writes a story, before he starts it, he thinks, okay, I need to work on this in this story. This is the writing skill that I'm working on in this story. It is snappier dialogue, or I don't know what. Well, see, that seems like a really interesting experiment that you could do, where if you pick a thing before you start on your next piece and say, that's what I'm going to work on on this, 
I, but but the, the problem is there's no knowing what you would have written without having that in mind. But sometimes it might open a door that might not otherwise have been open, kind of like you were saying on uh, that story that we called Battle of the Ideas because we can't remember what it's really called. So, yeah, maybe if you're just like, okay, snap your dialogue, snap your... Okay, what if he says this? Oh, that would be really good. But what if he really said that to somebody? Holy cow, let's have him get suspended because he said that, you know? And, and the story takes a left turn that it wouldn't have taken if you'd not been focusing on snappy dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely something that uh, could happen from it. I think that's a, a, a worthwhile rule, a meaningful rule. No work is wasted. No work is wasted. Everybody I know, except for Abby, has started on a book or started on a story and then given up halfway through or partway through. You know, everybody I know who wants to be a writer has failed in that. And maybe you feel like a failure. Maybe you feel like you're worthless because you didn't finish that thing. But I think our Pixar storyteller would say, or Pixar, Pixar storyboard artist, is that, can you say storyboarder? Like skateboarder? Can you say storyboarder? You might be able to, but that might mean somebody who um, Waterboards, puts, yeah. puts wheels onto storyboard pictures and actually does tricks with them. So I don't know if that really... It was from that brief period when Tony Hawk worked for Pixar. Yeah. But I would think that she would agree with that. You know, It's like, okay, you've written the first three chapters of a book that never got done. That's not wasted work i mean it helped you improve your skills as a storyteller and i i, mean, I don't know because we've all felt that we've all felt like we are a failure because we didn't reach the end but maybe it's just more practice it's more batting practice or free throws and then you were benched the whole game you didn't get to play the game but it makes you better for when you get to actually be in the game yeah yeah so i don't know if sports analogies as you well know i but i, I was trying it was a nice try. Well, a nice try is the best we can ask for in a worst marathon ever. Second worst. Come on, man. Oh, okay. I was being too hard on myself again. Okay, I've been Rish Outfield, and we'll come back again tomorrow, right? See you then. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Doesn't have to be, but it is. I'm just going to say, edit this next uh, five minutes out while I search, and le and then I'll answer your question, okay? Does it have to take five minutes? <laughs> now I want you to make a really poor edit where it, like, cuts right in the middle of me speaking, <laughs> and then we'll come back. <laughs> like a, a Plinket kind of edit. <laughs> I love those bad edits on the Plinket thing. Remember, Plinkett says, they should make a character that does this and this. And we'll call this character, I don't know, Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> I sure love to. Okay, on Twitter, Pixar storyboard artist Emma Coates has compiled nuggets <laughs> of narrative wisdom she's received working for Animation Studio over the years. It's some sage stuff. Although there's nothing here about defending yourself from your childhood toys when they inevitably come to life with murder in their hearts. A truly glaring admission. Omission, sorry. 